good evening everyone trust you are all doing very well and are taking good care of yourselves and your near and dear ones welcome to the second session of scientifically speaking season 4 this is a public engagement series initiated by ashoka university the aim is to connect high school students and anyone who's keen to learn with interdisciplinary scientists who are trying to solve complex problems my name is yukti and i'll be your host for today's session I'm leading the academic communications work here at Ashoka University. Prior to joining Ashoka, I finished my PhD in chemistry from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. So, without much ado, I will quickly introduce our speaker for today. We have with us Dr. Lasya Samita. She is the assistant professor of biology at Ashoka University. Lasya received her bachelor's degree from Mount Carmel College in Bengaluru, majoring in chemistry, microbiology, and zoology. Subsequently, she joined the integrated PhD program at the Indian Institute of Science, Bengaluru. After her PhD, she worked as an independent science writer and communicator for a year, writing for newspapers and magazines such as New Scientist and The Scientist. And then she returned to research with a DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance Early Career Fellowship at the National Center for Biological Sciences, Bengaluru, where she developed her ideas on how errors in uh, protein synthesis could aid in adaptation. uh going forward her lab will explore uh, problems at the intersection of molecular biology and evolutionary biology in the areas of protein synthesis and antibiotic resistance in today's session dr samita will bust some of the common science myths using real world example in particular she will focus on work of a renowned indian women scientist and odissi performer her name is dr priyambada mohanty hijmari she studied how lost body parts can be regrown in some organisms at uh, inappropriate places and more is what lasya will be shedding light on before we begin i will request our audience to type in their questions during the session and we'll address them after the talk on that note i would like to invite lasya we are very excited and look forward to your session today over to you thanks yukti uh, shall i share the screen sure <clears throat> okay hello everybody i am really excited to be here at this forum today and also honored to be a part of this popular science talk series which has had such good speakers in the past so today we'll be talking about some ideas that come to people's minds typically when they think of science and scientists in particular we'll discuss three of these ideas and see how they are in fact not true their misconceptions or myths and i hope by the end of the talk you will agree with me that we have done a decent job busting these myths using real world examples so you can see in my title i use the word transfiguration spell and the picture that you see here is an example of an incompletely performed transfiguration spell from jk rowling's harry potter series which i think many of you are possibly familiar with but what this shows is a water goblet that was intended to be turned into an animal instead you still have part of the water goblet and you have a tail of an animal so by the end of the talk you will see why this kind of half and half transformation is relevant to today's discussion let's dive straight in now like i said there are three myths that we will be talking about uh so myth 1 myth 1 is that science is a one person enterprise uh which means it sort of conjures up this idea of a lone genius working in a laboratory who has this poof idea that comes out of nowhere and then you make some path breaking discovery based on that so this is untrue to the extent of really almost being a myth um and i think part of part of partly why this is propagated is because when we study science in school we hear of discoveries as being associated with one person so we hear of sir isaac newton who's called the father of physics and typically we have this picture of an apple falling on his head um and the entire sort of discussion or this this um, the way we are taught often makes it appear that until the apple fell on his head there was nothing at all in the field that happened before that and suddenly that gave rise to this discovery similarly we hear of gregor mendel who is often called the father of genetics and again we think of the entire field of genetics as something that was you know born with mendel now it's true that in both of these specific cases these people did completely transformative work that defined fields for generations to come but it's also true that in their case as well they had to work with the state of knowledge at the time so they had to build on what knowledge was already there and they also had to build substantially on the work of people who came before them this is a while ago 
particularly in modern organized science, there is no question that almost everything that is done, published and discussed is a multi-person enterprise. Just as an example, let's look at the last three Nobel Prizes, 2019, 2020 and 2021 that were given for biology or medicine. You will see that in every case, there is a minimum of two people. And in two cases, there are three people cited. Now, the Nobel Prize has a limit of three people. So you can't award it to more than three people at a time. If you could, you would often see more than this number. The bigger point I want to make here, though, is that behind each of these prizes, in addition to these two or three people who are listed here, in fact, there is an entire army of people who worked in their labs. So PhD students, postdocs, maybe lab managers, technicians, and so on, who are not listed here. So it's often easy for us to associate discoveries with one or two people and forget that behind them a huge number of people contributed to the finding. I think in recent times, one sort of phenomenon, you could say, that has really brought to the fore the fact that science is interdisciplinary, involves multiple people working together, and that can be speeded up by multiple people working together, has been work during the COVID pandemic. So we've all now been through the pandemic for two to almost three years. And what happened very early on when COVID came in 1920, uh, 2020, sorry, 2020, is that there was a burst of ideas and experiments from the world over. So you can see in this slide, which is a sort of cartoon depiction of a famous Japanese painting, it shows a deluge of papers. Now, these papers and ideas came not just from biologists, uh, which would sort of be the default expected people who would contribute to understanding about viruses, but also say from engineers who came up with better and better ways of filtration, building masks, which all of us used, came from physicists and mathematicians who worked on models because it was important to understand how fast the virus spreads, how it spreads, uh, how virulent is it? So if one person catches it, uh, what are the odds that another person in the vicinity of that area will catch it and so on? So many, many people from different different uh, areas of expertise contributed to this deluge. Let's see some specific examples of work that uh, sort of is representative of a multi-person enterprise. So one of the first things that was important to do during COVID was to gather data on symptoms because you wanted to know who really has COVID and who has some other viral infection or some possibly a bacterial infection. So one had to work on collating symptoms and say, okay, if you have this set of symptoms, you probably are down with COVID. One also had to work on viral biology to understand how the virus is replicating and how it may be causing infection. Now, coming to the understanding of viral biology, it relied very heavily on work done with past one past pandemic and another epidemic. SARS, which you all heard of, that is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, and MERS, which is a Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which, as the name suggests, was restricted to the Middle East, but was nonetheless a very severe infection while it lasted. Had we not done work on these two, it would have taken us much longer to understand the biology of the virus during SARS-CoV-2 infections, that is, during COVID. Now, many of us, and probably all of us here in this audience, uh, must have Googled on a fairly regular basis to look at graphs like this during COVID. So this graph on the y-axis shows the number of cases in millions. On the x-axis, it shows you how many new cases came up in successive, this, this has a 20-day uh, gap. So every 20 days, how many new cases came up in various different continents and countries. Now, while, uh, when, while we were sort of very easily Googling and looking at these, it's important to remember that a lot of different people contribute to the generation of graphs like these. And that's not even just scientists. You need public health workers. You need people who will collect data at local centers in each city, in each town, in each village, put it together. You need people who will collect it, combine it, and so on. So you have scientists, you have non-scientists, you have reporters and journalists, you have science communicators, and various other people who enter this enterprise. The other important thing to do was to combine sequences of viral genomes. So because people wanted to know how fast is this virus changing? How fast is it mutating? What does it mean for us if the virus mutates? Is it getting less infectious? Is it getting more infectious and so on? So to get to all of those kinds of questions, you first have to understand what is the genome of the virus when you isolate it from different parts of the world. So this sort of compiling of viral genome sequence data and infection data across the world had already been started earlier uh, and I'm just taking the example of two particular uh, websites that did a very good job of compiling this. One is GSAID, which existed since 2008. Uh, GSAID compiled data on influenza infections, and it also got on very quickly to COVID. 
Nextstrain.org is a more recent enterprise. And Nextstrain did a beautiful job of collecting sequences, again, by working with multiple people collaboratively across the world, compiling these sequences and making them available to the public. I'll just show you an example. This is a screenshot from my laptop. And what this shows is the distribution of various different strains. These color codes, it says A1, 1.1, A2, et cetera. Each of these is a different viral strain. And you can see from these pie chart-like figures, the distribution of how much of that strain is present in a given geographical region of the country. But note that this is not for COVID. This is for monkeypox. This is for different variants of monkeypox. Now, monkeypox as I'm sure most of you have heard again, is a very recent infection. So the fact that so quickly we're able to pounce onto a recent infection and map this is evidence of the fact that processes were set in place so well during COVID. And we're able to now be in a state of what is called pandemic preparedness, at least as far as this goes, this sort of compiling of information goes. Now, across the world, there were also multi-institute consortia of experts because it became important to combat misinformation. So not only was it important to make sure that we got good, information, reliable information and spread it to the public, but it was important to combat panic. And for example, taking of fake medicines, promotion of something that people would claim was a vaccine much before vaccines were developed and so on. So this was done by, as I said, many people across the world. I'm only listing two sites or two consortia that worked in India. Again, this not only involved scientists, but it involved, for example, translators because it was important to get the information out to the public in multiple languages, particularly in a country like ours. Of course, it involved science communicators, it involved doctors, it involved teachers, and so on. Finally, from the beginning, it was clear that all of this work on COVID is ultimately aimed at finding a way to deal with the virus, so either a vaccine or a drug. And we know now that, I mean, we have, most of us, I think, are vaccinated in this audience, most if not all. And the process of producing, testing, and making publicly available these vaccines happened in record time. So no vaccine before COVID has reached us in less than a year's time because most often vaccine development is a slow process. You have to test, you have to test on large populations, and the initial stage itself takes a long time. Again, part of the reason this was accelerated was because SARS vaccines, work had been done on SARS vaccines previously. But another big reason why it was accelerated is because of the huge multi-person, multi-institute collaboration that happened across the world. So people shared information, people shared expertise. There were public enterprises that jumped onto this, private enterprises, this sort of a public-private partnership and so on. So now we had not just one, but several, uh, more than 10 vaccines that have been generated across the world. So I hope I have convinced you for this part that A, science builds heavily on past discoveries. B, organized science is a global as well as an interdisciplinary enterprise. And that collaborations make science better and make it faster. Right. So let's get to myth two. What is myth two? Myth two is the idea that doing science means that you have to be cooped up in a lab. So this is obviously not a very pleasant idea. One gets the feeling that you have to be in a dark place and probably mixing chemicals. You can't step out. And a lot of cartoons of scientists also show cobwebs, people with long beards and squinty eyes. Who's, you know, it looks like they've never seen the sunlight. So this, I think, can be disproved by the work of many people. But uh, let's start by thinking of this, this idea that there are some sorts of questions in science, which in fact you cannot ask in a lab. So I will take a slightly extreme example, which is animal behavior for large animals. Clearly, if you're working with elephants, you cannot bring them into a lab. But it doesn't have to be an elephant. It can be various other sorts of animals, even animals that are much smaller. Because if you want to observe how animals are behaving in the wild, you are not sure that bringing them to the laboratory is replicating the same conditions. So in many cases, ecologists, evolutionary biologists, naturalists do their work outside in the wild. And this is not the only kind of work that needs to be done outside. Let's say you're working on something that improves, say, agricultural yield, or you're working on biopesticides, and uh, you want to see how these biopesticides work out in nature. Even if the primary work for this is done in a lab, you still have to be able to go out into the field, test these things, and that requires multiple uh, rounds of field work. So again, that cannot be done if you're cooped up in a lab. I can give very many examples, but I'm going to stick with this first that I mentioned about animal behavior, the next about field testing of various kinds of uh, products and transgenic crops. Finally, what we just spoke about before this, which is pandemic preparedness and what are called zoonotic infections. A zoonotic infection 
is just an infection that you catch from an animal. So it's an animal that is a, typically an, an uh, infection that affects some animal, but now jumps to humans from them. So this again requires, for example, now this has become a very big enterprise uh, that is sampling pathogens in the wild. Since we are seeing more and more such infections coming up, it's important to go out, take samples from nature, which could be water samples, soil samples, it could be from dung of animals, uh, because you want to sample what viruses, what bacteria are out there, which can cause human infections. Right. Now, another thing that I want to sort of highlight here is that one of the biggest conceptual advances in biology, maybe the biggest conceptual advance, came from travel. And this is the theory of natural selection or theory of evolution by natural selection, which would possibly not have come, not have uh, been conceptualized at all, except for the extensive travel carried out by the two people involved in coming up with it, that is Darwin and Wallace. This is an interactive picture that shows the journey that Darwin took. Uh, and you can see at various, so I encourage you to go look at the site later because it's it's really quite um, quite a nice way to follow the travel and it tells you what he did at various points of time. So, but the point I want to make through all this is essentially that travel and being outdoors is certainly for biology, uh, also to various extents for other enterprises, is certainly not something um, that is alien to the science. It's very much a part of doing science. Right. So this brings me to myth three. And myth three says that if you're a scientist, you cannot do anything else. That is that you have to be completely passionately involved in the work and only the work. You cannot, for example, pursue serious hobbies and maybe you don't have the time to do anything else. Uh, again, I think many people have to different extents disproved this, but I'm going to speak very briefly about the work of one person uh, who's an Indian woman scientist who has disproved this, I think, quite comprehensively. So this is Dr. Priyambada Mohanty Hajmadi. She is a developmental biologist. Uh, she established one of the early crop development labs in the country. So what a developmental biologist does typically is to try and understand how a single cell grows and divides to form many different kinds of cells, all of which ultimately come together to form an organism. So they try to understand various aspects of this process. This is a picture in the middle is Dr. Priyambada Mohanty Hajmadi uh, of her with two of her colleagues. And this is a group of people who were responsible for a few pioneering discoveries early on. This picture is quite recent, it's taken in 2012. This is also a picture of Dr. Priyambada from long ago, from 1955, and it shows her performing Odyssey. Now, Dr. Priyambada had two parallel careers. One as a scientist, a developmental biologist, the other as an Odyssey dancer, but popularizer as well. So she was not just someone who uh, performed Odyssey, but she was one of the people responsible for bringing Odyssey to the forefront as a classical Indian dance form. And in her own words, so you might you might wonder, OK, how did this affect for people who feel that oh, science should be an all encompassing enterprise? How did this affect her work? This is what she has to say. In retrospect, instead of being a distraction, it was the training in dance and music which helped me to cope, which helped me cope with several stresses and enriched my life in many ways. This is in her own words. Let's get into her work. What did she work with? So at the time that I'm going to be talking about, the work I'm going to be discussing today, Dr. Priyambada's lab worked with regeneration. Regeneration is the ability to grow back a lost body, body part that some animals have, but humans don't. You may have noticed in your house sometimes lizards scurrying across with the tails cut off, or you may have seen their tails getting cut off and they grow it back. In mythology, the famous uh, animal that has huge regenerative abilities is this hydra, the Lernian hydra. And this Lernian hydra is a seven-headed serpent, um, sorry, nine-headed serpent, where every time one head was cut off, it would grow back two heads. So it could grow back a lost body, body part. It was ultimately... Uh, killed by Hercules. There is also a hydra, an animal um, organism called a hydra. Some of you may have studied, this is an invertebrate. Uh, it belongs to phylum Cnidaria, and it also has super regenerative powers. So not only can it cut off a small body, I mean, regrow a small body part if you cut it off, but it can regrow the entire body itself from just a few tissues. So the regeneration, uh, also, I should mention that as you can imagine, regeneration is therefore has been a very attractive area for scientists to investigate because people have been trying to mimic it from the point of view of human health. So it's exciting from the basic biology point of view, 
it's also exciting from the health point of view because if you when humans unfortunate let's say you're unfortunate enough to lose a limb in an accident you want to know how you can regrow it so dr priyambada's lab was looking at regeneration in frog tadpoles as you can see from this picture in the top part this is a tadpole whose tail has been cut off and then it regrows the tail what they were trying to understand was how is this process affected by some externally applied chemicals and the specific chemical they were using was vitamin a which is i think a name familiar to all of you it's a vitamin why were they using vitamin a because vitamin a was already known to impact development so it was known that vitamin a can do some strange things and perturb normal development but they didn't know how it would impact regeneration in a vertebrate model interestingly what they found was when you treat these tadpoles cut off tadpole tails with vitamin a instead of regrowing a tail it grows legs so it's like some information has been misplaced and in the body instead of telling this uh, tadpole to grow a leg has somehow told it to grow uh, to grow a tail it has somehow told it to grow legs you can see that extended treatment with the same vitamin a this is for one day this is for five days results in a really sort of uh, messy structure where you have not just two legs but up to seven legs growing so this was a at the time this is something called a homeotic transformation a homeotic transformation means one organ grows in place of another so wrongly or at the wrong place and at the time this was a, a pioneering finding because nobody had seen this so clearly in a vertebrate model however it was already known that there is something called homeotic transformation and in fact it was known which genes are likely to control this kind of a process this came from a lot of studies that were done in fruit flies or drosophila which some of you may have heard of this is an example of a drosophila in magnified drosophila head instead of antennae as you can see here it has legs so this is a mutant called antenna pedia where instead of antennae you have legs and they knew that this came comes from a mutation in something called a homeo box gene that's the name of the gene so what are these homeo box genes i'm taking the fruit fly as an example here because a lot of the work early work was done with fruit flies essentially homeobox genes are a set of genes which tell a developing embryo where to form which organ so it lays down the body plan and it sort of gives signals to say okay as you're growing you form a leg here you form an abdominal part here you form a wing here a mouth part here and so on what is also interesting is that the way these genes are laid out if you read left to right look at the color coding corresponds to the organ that it controls so the green which is right at the back here or or the first gene here is right at the back of the organism the red which is right uh, to the rightmost here corresponds to the mouth part in the front of the organs but what was even more sort of stark as people did more and more work was that this was not limited to fruit flies uh, or for that matter to tadpoles but seemed to apply across all life forms so this is a mouse embryo and you can see that in mouse embryos also there's pretty much the same sort of layout there's green here there's yellow here there's white here and then there's red finally so it was already known that a mutation in the gene such as a homeo box gene can cause this kind of homeotic transformation what was not known was why should adding vitamin a make any difference now i can't don't have time to get into the details of this but very briefly what people found a few years later was that there are receptors for vitamin a like molecules near these homeo box genes specifically for a molecule called retinoic acid so it turned out that you can have this molecule come and bind that is bind on the dna and then tell these genes okay now you make a leg here or don't make a leg make a tail here so basically occasionally mess up the normal body plan that is laid out during embryonic development by these genes uh so just to give you a, a sense for a recent discovery that has come about uh, relate, related to regeneration because we started by talking about regeneration so something very exciting which suggests that in frog tadpoles there might in fact be a single gene control of regeneration so like i showed you there are many homeo box genes and the process of development is a complex one typically controlled by many genes so the idea that you can mutate one gene and that changes whether or not you can regenerate is an exciting one this is a gene that is happens to be called c answer the name is not important but the point is that if you just over express this one gene as you can see here you can make a separate head a separate eye if you remove the gene it turns out these tadpoles can no longer regenerate now with respect to dr priyambada's original finding there are still a lot of open questions uh, 
partly because they worked on a model of an Indian flog. It's called Uperidon and not the popular flog, frog model, which is used elsewhere, which is called Xenopus. That's a South African frog. Uh, so a lot of the genetic tools and other molecular tools that are developed for the other frog are not available for this one, partly because of that reason and partly because it is intrinsically difficult to do these manipulations in larger animals like frogs, multicellular vertebrates. We don't have all the answers. So, for example, we don't know precisely which cells are responsible. Are there stem cells? What kind of stem cells? Which ones are responsible for making this in the original observation that they made? What receptors work? Uh, precisely which genes that control limb development are activated? Why are they activated there? So these are some fundamental questions that have still not been answered over 20 years after the original discovery. But I hope that from today's talk, you will carry away these points. Primarily, one, that science is a multi-person, interdisciplinary, and collaborative enterprise. Second, that doing science definitely does not mean being cooked up in a lab. Finally, that when you're a scientist, you can most definitely pursue other interests. That brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you all for your attention. And this is a cartoon by Quentin Blake, which shows people doing many different things. And I hope you will all go ahead to do whatever you want in your lives as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lasya, for that engaging and insightful session. We do have a lot of questions from the audience. So let's just dive straight into that. So we'll start from uh, the simplest. Somebody is asking, what is a virus and where do viruses come from? Oh, okay. Right. Okay. What is a virus? Where do viruses come from? Good question. What is a virus? Actually, people in, in some sense, people haven't yet fully answered. But okay, viruses are sort of at the border of between living and non living organisms. And if you're asking with specific respect to COVID, the virus may have usually has some uh, genetic material that it has either DNA or RNA inside it, and it's covered by an outer covering, which is typically a protein. So in terms of chemistry, the virus is some genetic material covered by some protein. In the specific case of COVID, it was an RNA virus. Where do they come from? They're just like any other, uh, well, living organism. We think it has come through years of evolution. It has so been it, it it has come through years of evolution like any other living organism and if you're asking where does it come from to infect humans in this specific case of the covid infection uh, again actually we don't know 100 percent, but it's a good guess that it jumped from bats so it was infecting bats and then it started causing infections in humans and this can happen sometimes when contact between um, animals that carry the infection and humans increases and, you know, you, you can have uh, viruses that mutate and are now able to cause infections in humans. Uh, you sort of answered uh, uh, the next question from an audience a member who was asking, is COVID also a zoonotic disease and did SARS-CoV-2 mm -hmm. transfer to humans from bad? So the second part has already yeah, been answered think, by you. Yeah, so, I do, I, we don't, yeah, okay. We sort of don't 100% know, but it's the best guess, yes, that it came from bats. Okay, sure. So, uh, Lassa, someone is asking if researchers take appropriate measures such as wearing PPE kits, etc., while they collect samples from, say, cow dung or affected organisms while pursuing their research. Yeah, they should. Absolutely. I mean, under ideal conditions, they should. Because, yes, exactly, as you point out, um, I mean, quite apart from the risk of infection with a zoonotic infection, you might... Just the fact that, you know, you are dealing with things that may be unhygienic. There's other bacteria, other viruses that even normally infect humans, which you might contract. So, yes, you should be using something like a PP kit, at least a mask and gloves. Hmm. Sure. Thank you. So uh, uh, the next question is, although like solving a problem involves pursuing an interdisciplinary and collaborative approach, but defining the problem has to be a single person enterprise. What is your take on that? Like somebody, somebody nice is asking. Question. That. Okay, that's a nice question. Mm. Well, even well, yes, that's true. I mean, very often defining the problem can come down to one person. Not necessarily, though. You can also have groups of people defining, talking about a problem, working on it from different angles and sort of shaping it from different directions so that ultimately you come out with one polished problem, sort of defined problem. Um, but yes, so what happens typically is also, let's say somebody has a problem defined already, as you say, but in order to ex 
explore various aspects of the problem, you may need different expertise. And you may not have all of this expertise yourself. Let's say you want somebody to build a model, but you're not someone who has mathematical knowledge. So you want to take the help of someone who's good at computation or mathematics. Or maybe you want to use a fancy technique. You want to purify something or do something else, and you don't have access to this equipment. That's another reason. So skills is one thing. Equipment is another, why you might collaborate. Or even without any of that, just intellectually, conceptually, you may want to beat out the ideas. You may want to come up with some angle to the problem that because you're the only person who's been thinking about it, you haven't come up with it. So it's always useful to talk to people and discuss too. Even normally, right? It doesn't have to do with science. You might see different angles about angles of something, some idea, something you have in mind, just by talking to people. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, someone is asking, Lasya, can genome sequencing be controlled in the lab to decide which manipulation takes place? Okay, they are they are specifically asking about overexpressing the genes in in the lab and how it's done. Overexpressing and oh, how it's done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Right. So over typically what you do, so today we have tools which can help you cut out genes from animals. And this is most frequently and most um, easily done with microorganisms. But of course, it's also done with larger organisms like we just saw with frog tadpoles. But typically we have tools such as enzymes that can cut out pieces of DNA. You can then package it into vehicles which are called vectors. Uh, such as you may have heard the word plasmid, and then you can put it back into these organisms. So we have so there's various kinds of genetic tools that are available for this. And yes, you can take foreign DNA, package it into something, and deliver it into a different host. So yeah, we're able to do this. Sure. And yeah, it's, it's I mean I'm not sure I understood the controlled part. Do you mean? Do you think the person is asking if if you know if it might get out of hand or escape from the lab or something like that? Is yeah, that perhaps, the... perhaps yes. So the, the, well, the other thing is just the genome itself, even if it escapes from the lab, can't do anything. It's going to be degraded in some time. Uh, so it's only a living organism if it escapes that it can do something, that it can grow, divide, and so on. Genome typically, like we said, is made of DNA or RNA in some cases. And DNA, RNA will be very quickly cut by DNases and RNases if it's just lying around outside. Uh, but yes, entire organisms, if you're working with different kinds of organisms, typically, yes, you do make sure that containment procedures are in place and you don't you don't let them just go out like that. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. So the next question is, if you could suggest any simple experiments that can be done by high school students in the domain of developmental biology. Oh, no. Okay. I'm not, that's a great question. I'm not a developmental biologist by training, but this I think this is something we can chat about later. Could you ask the person to mail whoever the person is mail separately? Yes. So that's a longer, yes. longer discussion, I think. But yes. great question. I hope you can do it. Yeah. Sure. So the next question is, what's the current status of the regeneration process of human body parts like bones, joints, etc.? Right, right. Yeah, of course. Very important question. Nice question as well. So as of now, we don't have the ability to regenerate entire organs in the same way that some of the animals we spoke about do. So we don't yet have the ability to, let's say, if the, some body part is cut off to regrow it. But of course, a lot of work has been going on in this using different model systems. And as you may know, people now can grow to a limited extent artificial organs. So you can use stem cells and you can build, start building some kinds of organs. A lot of work is going on in this field. Uh, stem cell therapy, for example, which uses cells that are not yet defined, that they're not yet differentiated. So they're not liver cells or, or whatever, pancreas cells or hand cells, but they're sort of cells that can potentially become anything else. So with these sorts of cells and stem cell therapy, people have done a lot of work. So again, I'm not an expert to answer precisely what the state of the field is, but I can tell you that entire human bodies, uh, human organs, sorry, cannot be regenerated on human beings as such. Uh, but yes, there's a lot of development in people coming up with artificial organs and in using stem cells to help people regrow parts of their bodies. Uh, you, so maybe some of you know already, I don't know that, you may have seen in TV series and in movies that people often donate livers or parts of their livers. So they're still alive, but they're cutting off parts of their livers and giving it to a relative or to someone whom it matches. This is because the liver uh, can very quickly divide and make up. So in a sense, it can regenerate the rest, not the entire organ. So if you remove the entire liver, it can't grow back, but it can regenerate parts of the organ. Uh, and in the human body, that's probably the most uh, most regenerative. I mean, that's the organ that can manage. Even if you remove ninety percent of it, sometimes it grows back. So, 
Sure, sure. Thanks. Thank you, Lasya. So uh, the next question is that we sometimes see six fingers uh, in human beings. Is that an effect of vitamin A? Oh, oh wow. <laughs> hmm. No, well, okay, vitamin A, so vitamin A is present in the body, retinoic acid has been measured in the body, that's true, in tadpoles as well as in humans. As far as I know, no, but uh, let me check this and get back. I don't know if there is some role played by retinoic acid receptors in, in development, it's possible. I don't know this. Good question. So the next question is, what about the Hox genes present in humans? Can we huh. blame them sometimes for genetic conditions like polymelia? like having multiple limbs etc and yeah i guess you can blame them <laughs> so these so the other thing is these homeobox or hox genes are what are called master regulators i didn't get to mention that so they are not the genes that actually finally make the limb or whatever make the body part but they are one step above so they are the the, peop the genes that control the genes that make the body part so you could have something going wrong at the level of these hox genes or you could have something going wrong at the genetic level one step below which is the genes that are actually responsible for generating the uh, whatever specific body part. So yeah, not necessarily the Hox genes, but could be. Sure, sure. Thank you. So uh, the next question is, why do certain organisms have, I'm not sure what this, this means, but I'm pretty sure that you would have an idea of this. So why do certain organisms have uh, totipotent cells such as lizards? However, others don't. Is there an evolutionary explanation to this? Yeah, good question. So no, I don't think we know why some animals have more uh, like hydra or okay, more than lizard hydra. So hydra are particularly special because like I said, pretty much any part of their body you cut off, they grow back. Uh, that is not true for all other animals. Like you cut off a tadpole's head, it doesn't grow, it doesn't grow back. Uh, but yeah, I don't think actually we know precisely why some animals why questions in general in biology are a little bit hard you know to answer why has this come about how it's come about we're trying to understand and we're trying to see how it can be uh you know better understood and of course also used in human health yeah no i don't i don't know that there is an answer but i can try find out from someone who knows more about this sure sure so uh Lassa, the next question is has vitamin a been experimented on humans to gauge any science signs for regeneration you mean like whether, in tadpoles like in tadpoles you mean Is, have they added bits of vitamin a yeah. so in culture i believe they have actually uh, so okay so firstly experiments with humans uh, as an entire full intact grown humans uh, for various reasons, including ethical ones, obviously is a little difficult to do any kind of experiment. Getting in humans in a laboratory and experimenting on them is obviously not, not a trivial thing. But what people do is they use cells that are derived from humans. And then yes, you can perform experiments on those cells. Uh, but yeah, with vitamin A treatment, people have done on growing uh, so special kinds of human cells that are grown in a laboratory. But to the best of my knowledge, it hasn't generated uh, limbs. I mean, so, so the thing is in general it's very difficult so these cells in particular stem cells are very difficult to culture so that's why it's been such a it's taken so many years for people to come up with good ways of growing stem cells because nobody really knows what is the best ideal medium in which they would be present and happy inside the body right so you want to come up with that perfect combination which will keep them happy and keep them in a position where with xyz trigger they should form the organ you want so that sort of has been an extremely difficult process but after years of work people are managing it for some some uh, organs which is how they're also starting to build artificial organs yeah okay so the next question is regarding monkeypox so somebody is asking what is monkeypox and is it similar oh. to coronavirus Oh, okay, okay. Good question. Maybe I should have said that. No, it's not similar to coronavirus. Monkeypox is a DNA virus. That's like we just spoke a little while ago. Some viruses have DNA uh, and some viruses have RNA. So coronavirus uh, looks has, looks as if, if you look through the microscope, it looks like it has a crown on its head. That's why corona. Corona means crown. This one belongs to a different group of viruses. It's called pox viridae. So it's more related to, say, smallpox or cowpox those those kinds of viruses and it has dna inside it so yeah it's not similar but okay if you're asking what is monkeypox it's a recent it's also an infection that has a uh, recently a zoonotic infection as the name suggests from monkeys monkeypox that has recently been hitting the news because in fact delhi had a delhi had a couple of cases kerala has had cases so in india it's still limited thankfully uh, but in parts of europe 
it has uh, there have been many more cases so there has been some concern about this viral infection and how one deals with it but so far it's not been very severe which is a good thing thank you thank you nasya so the next question is uh, why was vitamin a used in this particular experiment rather than just directly using retinoic acid in the tadpole culture would this have a different outcome ha okay that's a good question yeah yeah okay so i right so at the time i'm talking about uh, as we went through the talk i told you about things that were done in the past and then more information that we got later at the time that this was done people knew uh, that they knew that retinoic acid like molecules could could have an effect but it was not sort of not very well worked out for example it was also known and this is again something that more work has been done on recently it was also known that there are other chemicals something called a fibroblast growth factor that people have worked a lot on uh, so these two were the big candidates retinoic acid like molecules and fibroblast growth factor and so they used a retinoic acid like molecule which is vitamin a but in fact other people use retinoic acid as well you're absolutely right not everyone used vitamin a and in mice for example mouse embryos retinoic acid was used and with retinoic acid uh, around the same time that this observation was made in tadpoles with retinoic acid they found a similar uh, similar observation so in that in the in the case of the mice it was with the vertebrae they found that extra vertebrae were coming and vertebrae were forming where they shouldn't be present so yes you could you could use either yeah i don't actually know why at the point that this lab decided to test vitamin a they used vitamin a and not retinoic acid yeah. sure thank you lasya so uh, the next question is where exactly are stem cells found or where are they produced oh okay so stem okay so firstly stem cells are formed at found i should say all over the body technically so you know the stem cells the liver the stem cells in the whatever in the head in the limbs in in bone and so on but uh, at in an adult body so because typically you're concerned with when someone has an injury or something else you're not an embryo right you're you're a baby or you're an adult in an adult body it's very difficult for us to pull out stem cells from most places because there are very few of them and like i said we haven't developed good ways to culture them so in the case of human beings you may have heard that most often the source for stem cells is the bone marrow pull it out of the bone marrow because the bone marrow has uh, an actively dividing stem cell population and it's easier to get larger numbers but technically it is present i mean stem cells are responsible for giving rise to all organs in the body or everything in the body it's just that when you want to pull it out of adults it's typically done from bone marrow in humans sure. thank you <laughs> so uh, the next question is if you could shed some light on the similarities between nipa virus and corona virus are there at all any similarities between the two but sorry one second one second sorry wait one second parul could you repeat what you're saying i'm losing this a little bit i'm so sorry no worries so someone is asking uh, uh how is uh, how, like are there any similarities between nipa virus and corona virus nipa n i p a nipa, nipa. yes yes oh acha okay okay um okay i don't know specifically about are there similarities in what well it's also a zoonotic infection which means mm -hmm. that it's it's also uh, transmitted to humans in fact also from bats so yes that is a similarity mm -hmm. transmitted to humans from bats um it is a virus for which we have had outbreaks in india before it's what else can i tell it's a different kind of virus it's something called a paramyxo virus so mm -hmm. in that sense it's different um it's known to be transmitted by fruit bats it's known that human to human transmission occurs we've had it in india yeah i don't i don't uh, know enough to give more details it can cause encephalitis this i know that is it can cause uh, brain infections but yeah i don't know enough about the virus to to get into more details sure 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 it's so, a different uh, Sorry, sorry, Lassa. You were saying something. No, no, no. I was just saying it's a different group of virus, but yeah, it's similar in that. I guess it also causes a zoonotic infection, and we've had it in India for right. a while, actually, on off. Yeah. So this is this is a a general question where someone is asking what, according to you, should be the mindset of a person to become a successful researcher. Oh, that's tough. What should be the mindset of a person? Hmm. well i think you have to be really interested 
you have to be, I don't think this is something that can come from the outside. So somebody else telling you this is what you should do will not work. If you are interested, you're sure that you're really, really passionate, enthusiastic about something. I think that's the primary requirement. It's probably the primary requirement for many other things as well, anything that you're really keen on doing. But in research, maybe one difference is that once you get in, a lot, a lot of experiments and a lot of things you try initially fail. So you know, uh, you it's it's useful to have to know to have a passion for the work and to know that failing an experiment failing doesn't mean that your idea has failed or doesn't mean that you in any way are a failure as a scientist. So it helps to have passion for the work. It helps to, yeah. I think I think that's the main thing. I think the main thing is to have passion for the work. Yeah. So last and the next question seems a bit interesting. So someone yeah. is asking. What's the survival rate for these modified organisms? Do they survive successfully? Uh, like the uh, the ones that those are not modified compared to that? And if yes, is there any research into how offsprings of these organisms are affected? Oh, wow. Nice question. So I'm guessing modified means you're talking about the homeotic modification. Right. So right. yeah, as you can imagine, animals that have seven legs, six legs, you know, and that are they're modified to a large extent are usually sick. Yes, they don't survive very long. But because they don't survive very long, the question of what happens to their offspring, I mean, they don't end up having offspring. But yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. I should look this up for, for uh, uh, organisms that are homeotically transformed in cases where people have looked at uh, their offspring, how long they survive. Good question, yeah. But if you're asking, if your question is whether the offspring will themselves be born homeotically transformed, then the answer is no, because you have done something externally to this animal to cause the ch change, and there's no reason to expect, unless it's a mutant, that's a different thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, otherwise, there's no reason to expect that that is passed on to the next generation. Certainly not so, with the vitamin A. Right. All right. So the next question is about uh, if you could share some of the career opportunities as a life sciences researcher. Huh. So career opportunities for somebody who does research in life science. OK, so we've talked or the little bit of work that we discussed was uh, about someone who was in academics, right, who was in academic research and did experiments and yeah, basically was involved in basic biology you could also do work be a researcher and do work on applicative biology that has come up with different ways of dealing with real world problems making making different devices or you know various things like that but apart from academics there's many other things you can do as a life science researcher uh, one obvious alternative that people explore more and more these days is industry so you can work in the industry in life sciences and that could be something related to pharmaceuticals it could be something related to medicine in various ways it could be something that's not even directly related to pharmaceuticals or medicine there are uh, even professions now uh, such as life science consultants so you can be somebody who's got a phd let's say or who's who's let forget the phd who's worked deeply in life sciences and you have knowledge that other people uh, find useful so that they want to use you as a consultant and say hey i'm thinking of building this this device or doing this this is it a good idea and that but apart from industry you can be a writer you can be a communicator you can be involved in determining policy um yeah this is there's a lot of different things you can do as a life science researcher sure thank you lasia so the next question is uh, something not exactly coming from your talk, but huh. maybe we can just take this up. So someone is asking the sheep dolly that uh, was produced, I guess, in Edinburgh uh, mm -hmm. was was a clone. And Correct. So is cloning a form of genetic regeneration? Ah, interesting. So the way uh, that regeneration was defined here um was to re i mean during this talk and the typical way in which the word regeneration is used is as the word suggests regeneration right so you've already generated something you're removing that or in some way damaging it and it is regenerated now in the case of cloning you're doing something entirely new so no i would not say it is regenerating because what you're doing and what happened in the case of dolly also is that you're taking some cells from an adult organism uh 
and then taking that okay then in the, i'm taking the case of dolly you're taking some cells from an adult organism and then somehow you're doing things to the cell inducing it to divide and then form another complete organism on its own that was the cloning performed with dolly so no i would not call that regeneration but it's an interesting idea it's a nice nice link that uh, hadn't hadn't struck me yeah sure thank you so uh, next question is again a general question someone is huh. asking how can students learn ab more about female scientists and their contributions like indian female scientists and their contributions do we have any book recommendations yeah actually i do uh, okay i forgot in the title i can look and get back to this but please google the life of science.com okay so these people the two women who run the life of science.com have put together a really nice book and a calendar specific to women scientists across the country and if you are active on social media yay okay super <laughs> you have the calendar so you yeah. has the calendar there's a book as well um i think actually it's called women scientists in india women scientists i, I guess, forget yes. the i have it i forget the title but if you're active on social media you can follow them on twitter and they frequently you'll see in their twitter thread as well you'll see the the name of the book how you can buy it you can get hold of it and it's a really really nice uh, production and i strongly recommend that anybody interested read it really nice and yeah i mean i i think for all of us certainly for me it brings up the names and contributions of people that we have never read about in textbooks so even if you do a science degree you've never read about in textbooks so i think it's really nice so it's a huge effort and it's it's really nice yeah thank you also like the next question is how easy or difficult is it for the researchers from different disciplines to communicate while they work on the same project solving same problem so today i think in today's day and age not difficult at all uh, because of course right with with the internet with, with exactly what we're doing now we're all sitting in different places talking here so with the way communication has developed i would say not at all difficult today when I mean, the difficulty is not about technology but probably more about making time you know everybody coordinating particularly if you're in different countries coordinating across time zones but i don't think that's such a major difficulty you know the main main thing is smoothed out so today no um in olden times before the internet uh, before communication was this kind of communication digital communication was popular um i would guess yes harder than now but even then people you know people talk to each other they wrote to each other they discuss many of the things we went through while we were talking about our work today uh, darwin and wallace in the voyage for example so people had extensive correspondences with other scientists naturalists people who are interested in their fields they wrote letters to each other Uh, when they published something they made they shared copies of what they had written discussed with people of course met people in person as well when they were local so yeah i think in today's day and age i would say not difficult at all yeah sure sure so uh, i think we'll uh, take this as one last question and then we'll uh, sort of wrap this session up which mm -hmm. type of research according to you is better experimental or computational or a mix of both is better okay i don't think either is better they're both very nice in their own ways it depends on the question you want to ask um obviously it's nice if you can approach something from both angles like you do the experiment and if if it is a question that is amenable to computation then you you try um, you know you sort of see what the answer is from a computational point of view and sometimes from computational techniques if you predict something you want to be able to do the experiment to show that look i predicted this on the computer and now i've shown that it works or i've shown that it doesn't work and this is why i think it doesn't work either way but yeah no i don't think there's any better or worse that there are two different ways can be two different ways of approaching the same problem and and uh, computational work certainly does not mean that a single person is working on that problem it also involves a lot of collaboration because no, this is of course yeah. yes yes of course absolutely yeah yeah well not necessarily then either of it see you can also it's true that just to sort of move to the other end from everything i've been saying of course it's true you can have a single person working in a laboratory you know doing experiments and then come and this has happened in the past it's not like it's never happened come up with specific discoveries but uh, the point i'm trying to make is that in order for any large uh consensus discovery or some some big step forward to happen it's extremely rare in today's world because it, by the time that happens you already had multiple people involved the initial primary discovery that sparks interest may indeed come from one person that's quite possible
certainly certainly yeah thank you thank you so much lasya for taking time out for such an enriching and engaging session today we have thank gotten some thank you very much the questions were really 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 cool some of them were googlies as well right <laughs> <It was very laughs> Sure. Thank you so much. So with this, we come to the end of today's session. And before leaving, I will really request you all to please take a minute to share your feedback. The feedback form is now available in the chat box. And the next session of Scientifically Speaking Season 4 is scheduled on Tuesday, which is 6th of September at 6 p.m. Indian Standard Time. And the session will be delivered by uh, Professor Vasudev Maji. He's the Assistant Professor of Chemistry and Biology at Ashoka University. He will talk about microscopic warfare and human health, how the microbes sort of fight our battle sometime. I would also like to inform our audience that registrations for the undergrad program starting next year, which is August 2023, are now open. I would encourage students to start early and have access to personalized mentorship with our academic counselors. They can have interactions with student Ashoka students to learn more about the campus life and receive guidance for Ashoka's holistic admission process. And Ashoka does offer a pure sciences BSc honors degree, including uh, physics, biology, chemistry, mathematics, computer sciences, as well as interdisciplinary majors in computer sciences and mathematics and computer sciences and entrepreneurship. So with that, we come to the end of today's session. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lasya, once again for being a part of Scientifically Speaking Season 4 and sparing time out for this engaging session. And we look forward to your participation in the next session on 6 September at 6 p.m. Till then, take care and stay safe. Thanks so much.